Today, the lecture will be on how to create user interfaces in Python, and specifically using the PyQt5 uh, Python module. Uh, I'm, I have a bit different setup this time, so I hope it will work. So um, let's see if we can continue here. So. So, first, a little bit about user interfaces. So, user interfaces on um, the different platforms uh, are implemented in different ways. So, currently, we have for the major desktop platforms, we have a Linux operating system, we have the Windows operating system, we have Mac OS operating system. And all of these um, um, operating systems have different ways of implementing user interfaces. And that makes it hard to implement user interfaces because on Linux, you have to implement it in a user interface toolkit called X11. On Windows, you have to use something called Win32 or WinRT uh, to implement your user interfaces. Um, so these, these can be compared to Python modules with different uh, named functions that you can call. And on Mac OS, you have something called UI Kit or NS Kit to implement that user interface. So how do we solve this user interface quandary here to create application that can be run on every platform? So in this case, you have to create a layer. Um, yeah, sorry, the applications are, of course, accessing the, these separately. So these individual applications are uh, accessing these individual, but that, that makes kind of, you have to implement three applications and that is not something we want to do. So we need to solve this in some way. So what you can do is you can put a layer in between uh, and this is a very common way to do it. And, and one of these layers is something called Qt, uh, which is a C++ uh, library that uh, encapsulates uh, all, the all the integrations, um, it encapsulates the native calling um, uh, toolkits in a single toolkit. So you as a programmer only have to remember one, one way of doing the application. So basically uh, you have to access the, the Qt library. And on top of the, the Qt library, you can uh, add something called PyQt5, which is a Python binding for the Qt library. So this is uh, um, the C++ library exposed to, to, to Python. So you can use all the, the classes and objects in, in Qt in Python. And then you can write one application. So you don't have to write three applications, uh, one for each platform. So in this case, that saves you a lot of code because you write one code and it runs on all platforms. Um, so Qt is a platform independent user interface library. And as I said before, it abstracts all the user interface concept into a single library. So you never have to call any of the native function of your operating system when you're using Qt. Uh, the user interface is also adapt to the current platform. Uh, so basically, um, if you're if you are implementing and running your application on a Windows platform, it looks like a Windows application. If you're running your application on a on a on a Mac, it looks like a Mac. And the same it goes for Linux. So it, it tried to adapt. So it, it doesn't kind of look exactly the same on all platforms, but it adapts so it's, it feels like a native application. You can also um, create your own styles. A typical example of that is the, if you look at the Spotify application, for example, uh, it doesn't look like a native Mac or Windows application. It has its own style. And that is all stuff you can do in, in Qt, you can you can define your style files to uh, style your user interface in, in the way you want it. Um, events, which is kind of the key concept in user interface libraries, um, it's kind of things that are moving around when you click something. There is an event triggered, and in in Qt, those events are handled using a special mechanism called signals and slots. So basically, these are virtual cables that connect. Uh, buttons with your code. So, and, and you can connect them uh, using uh, code or you can also connect them uh, using visual development tools. So Qt from, from uh, Qt is a C++ library. So if you want to write na native Qt li libraries uh, applications, you usually do that in C++. 
um, if you want to use Qt from Python, you, you, you need something called a binding. And a binding is a, a binary module in Python that connects Python with, with the C++ library underneath. And there are several, unfortunately, several bindings for Qt. So there is uh, PyQt5 which we are, and PyQt4, which we are going to use in this course. There is also Qt for Python, which is also called PySide, which is um, a binding that is developed by the Qt company. Um, and there's also Pyth Python Qt. There, there are some efforts to create modules that um, checks for install Qt versions and then ch changes this, but uh, this is too complicated for this course. So, but PyQt5 is, is what we're going to use in this course. So user interface programming is um, a bit different from what you're used to when programming uh, the applications you have been doing up, um, up until now. So you in your code, you have a, a main program that starts from one point and ends at, certain, uh, at the end of the program. So it kind of goes to a single line. Uh, an event-based or in user interface applications, usually the program just sits and waits and waits for you to click something. And, and this wait, uh, sitting and waiting is called an event loop. And this event loop just checks the ask Windows or Mac for, is there any messages from the operating system? And if there are messages, it responds to those messages and, and does things. So the messages can come from the keyboard, the mouse, system messages. If you have a touch enabled computers, you can also get touch messages that you can respond to. Uh, and this event loop dispatches a message to the code which handles the events. And this loops, this loop uh, is a kind of endless loop, but that runs until the last window has closed. So when the last window that you have created is closed, the event loop exits and the program exits. So basically the, the, the program is just sits waiting for you to do things. And it's your responsibility to connect the messages to your code using this signal to slot methods. So this is a pseudocode for uh, an event loop. It's not very complicated. Um, so I have a, there is a, a, a set of flag here, it's called running. So this is, this flag kind of determines if, if, the, if you should continue running here. And the first thing you do in the while loop here is, uh, if we're running, then we check for an event. And then we check, oh, if the event type is a button click, we handle the button click. Uh, we, we pass it to, to the code and then do something with it. And if the application has a, is there an event called quit, we go exit the application, we set the running flag to false and the event loop terminates. So this is a high level kind of understanding what, what event loop is. Most of this is hidden in Qt and other user interface libraries. You never see this, uh, the, the loop itself. Uh, <clears throat> So this is how it can look like in in um, in Python. So you have a you have a the import statement PyQt widgets, which is the where you have all the clauses for creating controls, windows, and, and stuff like that. Uh, we have a main application, and the first thing we do is we create an application object. An application object is a um, it encapsulates every, all the mechanisms around hand handling an application uh, on the different platforms. Uh, and it's also responsible for running the application, the event loop. So we create an application object. Uh, we create a widget, which is can be a window or button. We show the widget. And to, to make things happen, if, if we would stop here, the program would just show an empty window and it will be non-responsive, nothing would happen. So in the in the final part here, this is the important thing here. This is sysexit, that is just a way of exiting the application, but, but app.exec here, this is the event loop of the, the Qt um, framework. So when, when you call app.exec, it goes into this while loop and sits there and, and checks for messages until the last window has closed. Then this function exits and then you call sysexit here to, to tell Python to exit the application as well. So this is the main uh, 
this is the, the smallest uh, Qt application you can create. So now I will see if I can change screen sharing to this one here. So this sh shows you uh, a different screen here. So this is my application I showed before. Uh, I have my widgets here. So we will just see what happens when we run this. Uh, you can ignore this black window. It's just a way of uh, have started how this process is starting. But this is the uh, window here. I do, I do, you don't see the window. Oh. One moment. I run it again here. So now it shows. So th this is the uh, minimal minimum uh, uh, Qt application. So what it, what happens is that the, if you create a widget uh, like this, it will it can be anything. A widget is kind of abstract uh, graphical control that you can interact with. Uh, and if you don't do anything else, it will Qt will automatically add a window to this. So this window here is controlled by this uh, application object. So the application object together with the widget knows how to deal with resizing of the window. And if we ex exit now here, you can see here, it will close down our application and we can get back here again. So let's see here. So uh, the key widget is the base class for user interface objects, as I said before. Uh, and the widget can contain other user interface objects as well. And it will automatically create a window frame around it if, if there is no parent. Uh, and you can derive custom application window from um, Q widget. Uh, usually what you do is when you create a new application, so you create your own class for the window. So in this example here, we have a, my, my own class here called my window. It inherits from QWidget. I have a class constructor here that is called when I create a window. And the first thing it does is it creates, uh, it calls the init method of the, the QWidget uh, class. And then usually I usually create an init GUI method here that, that where I put all my user interface code generation, so to speak, what, all the calls that are needed to create my user interface. So in the first part here, we create set geometry that will set the window size. So in this case, X and Y, so at the 300 by 300, and then the width 600 and height 600. And I can also set the window title here, my window. And then I show the window here again. Yeah. So this is the larger example here. I have my class here. That is my own application window. Uh, and I create, in this case, I create my window here instead of uh, my widget. Uh, I also have encapsulated the show here, so I don't have to do the show here. I, I do this in the init GUI method, which is called by the constructor. So if I run this, now you see it. it uh, the window is more square. The title has also changed to my window here. Um, and it was positioned at 300 by 300.
so if you want to create user interface or more controls on your window, I mean, it's not a very uh, useful application just to show a window. You need to kind of do something more. So uh, what you can do then is uh, you can add controls to your window, for example. One, one obvious one would be would create a push button, for example, that you can, you can click on. And what you do then is you, you create uh, a window or a class attributes here called a self or button here. And then I create an object called Q push, push button. I give it a, a, the, the text that should be shown on, on the button. And then I give an owner here. So what this does is it creates a button that it attaches to my window here. So self here is my window. And this tells the button that it should be added to to the window control, the, the window frame here. I can set the tooltip here, a text that comes up if you hover over the button. I can set the size here, and I can move the, the button here. So here I have my, my button. Uh, this is the additional control I, I did. I didn't do anything more than that. Um, I kept the window properties here, the same size. So if I run this one here, you see here now I have a button here. So, uh, and you see here that all the mechanisms for showing all these things are already built into the to the push button object. So that is built-in functionality that that is built into the Qt library. And if you run this on a Mac, it will bring up a window on a Mac with a button with the identical code that I show here. So this is a way of creating uh, platform independent applications. So just a button to, on, on a window is not so useful. You need to kind of, um, the application need to, to tell your code when the button is pressed. And, and what you do then is that you, uh, you have to create a, a virtual cable between the, the graphical control on the screen and your code. Uh, and that is done using um, uh, something called signals and slots. And every control has a number of signals it can send out. Uh, there is also slots, which is our connectors that you can connect the signal to. So many controls can also have input connectors and, and as well as uh, signals. So for example, a button, there is a special signal called clicked, which you can connect to. Um, there is also a special signal called pressed, which is sent when the button is held down. And if you have a list box, which I, which I come, in, come to into later, you can do current row change, which is a signal that is sent when uh, an item is selected, a different item is selected in the list. Uh, the connection is done by using a special connect method. So you have a connect method here, uh, for example, for the clicked signal. So you have the my button object here, and it has a property called clicked which is the signal, and then you do dot connect, and then you just add a reference to your own function. So you create a function in, in your class, and then you connect the signal to this function. It uh, sounds more complicated than this. So let's see if I can. Uh, and here are some, some links to uh, where you can find more documentation on, on all the signals that are available for different controls. So as you can see here now, so I have created my button here, and now I want to, to connect this button to a function here. So uh, I have created also a, a method in my class here called on button clicked, uh, and I want that method to be called when I click the button. So then I do self button dot clicked, which is a signal, connect, and then self button on clicked. So let's see if we run this. And I just, it should show print hello here if it works. So let's see what happens here. So now the output will come in this, this black window here. So if I click press me here, you can see here that 
it shows hello here. So what happens here is, is that the Windows operating system detects a mouse click and it sends that mouse click to the window My Widget. And the Qt application uh, sits and waits in this event loop and it finds, okay, I got a message here and it's directed to this button here. And, and then it says, okay, I have a signal connected to this button. And then I call this method that is connected to the signal. So it's kind of a virtual um, electric cable that you can connect in different ways, a switch cable. There are some common control properties on the, on the um, widgets. So uh, you can change the visibility of a control. So basically make it show up in the window or make it invisible, but not shown at all. And that is controlled using the set visible method and the is visible method. So set visible will um, we give it a flag, true or false. It will um, show and hide the, the, the widget. You can query the state of the visible flag using the is visible method. You can activate the control and mean, mean basically make it that the user can interact with it. Uh, you can disable it uh, using set enabled force. Uh, then the, sh the control is shown on the screen, but you can't interact with it. And you can query a state with the is enabled method as well. Uh, focus is a special uh, method that um, determines which control has the active keyboard focus or the cursor. So for example, if you have a, a large form that you want to fill in, uh, the cursor is positioned in active control. So using the set focus method, you can, you can uh, move around the focus, which control that takes the text input for the moment. Uh, you can also set the fonts. Uh, usually text of the control is set using the set text method. And you can, re we can, you can query the text using the dot text method. So in this example here, I, I created three buttons, uh, button one, two, and three. Uh, I, I connect button one to the method one clicked, button two to the method two clicked. So when you click on the first button, uh, it will set, it will check if the, the second button is visible. And if it's visible, it sets it's a false. Otherwise it sets the, this button to visible true. If you select button two, it will, enable, check the enable status of the, the third button, enable, uh, uh, disable it. Uh, if you click uh, button two again, it will enable the button three control again. It's a bit small, I hope you can see, but if I press, press me here, you see that this control disappears. If I press this again, it appears again. If I press this one here, this one is disabled. I, I can't click it, it's kind of non-reactive, but it's still visible. And uh, this can be useful if you are um, um, want to prevent the user from doing things that is not available in your application currently. Uh, you can, uh, you can hide these controls from the user, uh, but still show them. So it's a, uh, they will not uh, send any signals, uh, but they still, it will still be shown. A um, little bit about window styles. So, um, uh, there are different windows, so the frames can look a bit different in, in uh, Windows. You can have a normal window that is resizable. You can have a window that is, looks more like a dialog box. You can have a window that is more like a, a toolbox style. Uh, and that is set with a, with a um, set, uh, when you initialize the windows, you, you set this.
So here now I, I just run a normal window here. And you see it looks like this. Uh, and you can resize the window in different ways like this. It has all the controls here for minimizing or maximizing like this. Uh, you can also create a window that is like a dialog box. And now you see here there, there is no minimize button. There is only a help button. Uh, there is also, uh, you can close it. Uh, it's still resizable, but has, it, it is not possible to kind of minimize it. We can't see the dialog box. Sorry, uh, I will try it again. Uh, can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Did you see the last window? Um, the previous windows wasn't also not. Uh, I, I will run it. Try it again, like this. So this is a normal window with the three controls here: maximize, minimize, restore, close. And then you can have a dialog window that has a question mark. A, a close button, but there is no minimize and maximize on these. And then there is a special special window type that is usually done for toolbox, floating toolbox windows. Uh, it looks something like this. It has a just a small close button here in a, in a somewhat more smaller um, title bar. It's also possible to do a maximized window. Sometimes you want to have the, the window on, uh, shown from the beginning on the entire screen. You can use the, the window state here to uh, tell it to be windows maximized. It the same, has the same effect as showing the, uh, pressing the maximize button on the window. And there's also a full screen. Uh, and with the full screen, you need to kind of make sure that you can, can come back because it covers the entire screen. So it will not show any window controls uh, on the screen. So let's show maximized here and run this. You see the entire screen is covered by white and the window is shown on the entire screen except for the for the uh, start menu but start menu in, in uh, at the lower part of the screen. If we change this to full screen, now you have to remember that you have a, uh, to know how you close a window in, in Windows without um, when you can't press here. So now you see my mouse is over a place here, but there is a control called Alt F4 which enables you to close the window using a keyboard shortcut. So full screen is a bit, you have to be a bit careful with that so you know how to get out of that window. Another way of interacting with application is through menus and toolbars. Uh, and menus are encapsulated in, in uh, implemented in several clauses in Python. So you have Q menu bar, which is the top menu, which, which you usually have in a, in a Windows application in, in the window. Uh, on a Mac, it will be the menu that is on the top of the screen. On Linux, it's the same as on, Lin uh, on Windows, so they will be part of the, the main window of your application. Uh, and you usually connect. What what is going to happen when you click a menu is uh, encapsulated in something called an action object. An action is a connection to the user interface. So, uh, and the reason we have the actions is because 
you have both menus and toolbars in an application. And usually the same actions will happen when you click a menu or you click a toolbar. So not so to not have to write too much code, uh, you, cre you create the signals in action objects which you, which you connect to both the toolbar and the menus at the same time. And then also the action object will also encapsulate both the, the graphics that you want to have uh, with, in the menu and in the toolbar together with the short keyboard shortcuts. So the, all that is, is kind of defined in the action object. Uh, and also when you disable a certain option in your menu, it will also be disabled in the toolbar at the same time. And also, so the events, the signals are connected to the actions instead of the controls. And then you assign the actions to your menus and toolbars. So in this case here, I have a, uh, defined an action here. Uh, it's called my action. Uh, it's attached to my main window. And here I set the shortcut here. This is what, uh, when you press control T, this will also trigger this action. So uh, you can click it, the menu, but you can also click the shortcut key that will generate the same action. And then you have a signal called triggered on the action that you connect to your own code in this case. And here you have file menu, self menu bar, add menu, uh, you have, uh, create a file menu. And then I, for the file menu, I, I add this action to this menu here, like this. So here I have my action here I created, and then I have, I create a file menu here, which I attach to the menu bar. So now I have, uh, when you want to create the uh, application with the menu bar on top, you need to create, derive from the Q main window clause. And that clause has um, a main toolbar, also status bar built in. So it, it has all the features that you, it's required by a main window clause. And here you see, I, I access a special menu bar, um, function here, which you can, which ret returns the, um, the menu bar object, which you can add a menu to, and then you define menu, add action, self my action here. So running this brings up a window here. So I have a file menu here, I can click like this, and now it shows me what happens here. I can also press control T on my keyboard uh, which you can't see here, but I'm doing it now. And you see here, it triggers the same uh, method. So in this way, the, the action is both, uh, you can attach both the menu to shortcut and also to a toolbar. So that was a menu. Uh, then you can create toolbars in the same way as you create menus. So in this case here, I have a, a add toolbar method here, uh, just gives it a name. And then I can do the same thing as with menu. I can add actions to my toolbar. Uh, in this case, I add the same action here. And you see here that I get the my action toolbar here. Uh, and you can of course add icons and images to this as well. So here I have my, my classic action here again. I have my menu and I have my toolbar here. So I add toolbar, my toolbar, and I then add my action to this toolbar as well. So now that the action here is available through the menu, through the shortcut and through the toolbar. So now you see you have a window here, an application with a toolbar. And all this, this interaction is automatically handled by the application object. Um, so you, you don't have to do anything of this. It will be automatically handled. What you also can do is you can, you can drag your toolbar somewhere else, attach it to the bottom. You can attach it to the, 
And all this mechanism is, is, is kind of available in Qt for free. So you don't have to do anything to implement this. Then I want to show a bit more complicated application. So here you see here all the code. I created uh, several actions here for a text editor type application. So I have menus, uh, new, open, save, uh, exit, cut, copy, paste, and so on. And so the actions are here, and then I have uh, I create a file menu, I create an edit menu, file toolbar, an edit toolbar, and then I attach all my actions here. There's also a way of creating a special separator in, in the menu to illustrate to kind of se logically separate different things in a menu, so it doesn't feel too uh, compact or easy, make it easier to read. Uh, you can do that in the same way in a toolbar. So running this application here, I see here you get the uh, added uh, icons here as well. So you see here I have a icons.copy here, uh, which is an icon which is loads to the toolbar here. And uh, you can see here that it triggers all this. Oh, sorry, I crashed my application as well. So New, new file here. I can do new file here, same thing. I can also press Control U in and also get this here. And you can, of course, reorganize your toolbars any way you like it, like this. So that is a cool thing. Uh, so here, layout management. So when you have controls on your screen, uh, for the moment we, we, we placed our button at a specific coordinate. We gave it a uh, width and height. Uh, this is called absolute positioning. And uh, there is also another option in, in, in Qt, which is much more powerful. It's called sizers. Uh, because if, you, if you're placing your uh, controls by yourself using coordinates, you're, you're, you're yourself responsible for kind of moving them on the, on, in the window and rescaling them if the window si resizes. Uh, and that is kind of really complicated. So what you can then do is use the sizers, which uh, automatically resize it to control according to a specific rule. So the first one we are going to look at is the VBOX sizer. And, and what that does is basically you, you add controls to the sizer and it will make sure that they are uh, vertically oriented. So basically it's like stacking them on top of each other. And if you resize the window, it will move the, the items uh, mm -hmm. from each other and automatically scale them to fit the entire window. So you can see here that we, you could create the controls just like uh, we did before. And then we create a layout here and we add all our widgets to this layout here. And then we set the window layout uh, to this vertical box. So the widget uh, can also have a layout. Well, so basically you, you attach the layout to the window and the window knows how to call the, the, the sizer when it resizes the win window automatically. So this is probably much easier to show. So here you can see my vertical box sizer here, and I add the widgets to it, attach the layout to the window. And if we run here, you can see here that I have a window here with four controls. Uh, we didn't give any coordinates for these controls. They are just placed in the window like this automatically with certain rules. So it, one rule is that it, there should be a certain spacing between the controls. Uh, and the controls should be expanded to the border of the screen, but it should have a certain margin between uh, margins uh, to the left and right. And also if I resize here, you can see it moves the controls automatically. Same thing in this, this direction here. There are also rules how small they can be. So if I try to resize them too small, it will stop. 
So there are also, it, it kind of uh, it's a rule based re uh, sizing algorithm. There is another one called uh, uh, HBox sizer, uh, which does the kind of uh, the other way around. So it stacks them horizontally instead. So four controls, same method. You just add widgets to this control, and if you run, they are now stacked horizontally like this. And if I change the size here. Uh, it will resize the buttons. And same thing here, if, if the buttons get too small, you can't uh, make it sm uh, smaller. It also uh, sets them, uh, si uh, puts them in the in the center of the window as well when you do resizes this vertically like this. Uh, it's also poss possible to uh, combine these. Uh, so you can have a uh, Controls that you can you can um, uh, mix them, so you, you can add a vertical sizer to a horizontal sizer and vice versa. Uh, and in this case here, I have a vertical box which I add four buttons to, and I have a horizontal box layout here which I add five, six, seven, and eight buttons. Uh, and then I add the horizontal horizontal box to the vertical box, so the the horizontal box will be placed. Um, as the final one in the vertical box. And the vertical box is the main layout of the window. So what do I, do I mean with all this? So the final layout will look something like this. So these are this is, is the, are the four, first four rows of the vertical box layout. This is the uh, horizontal box layout, which I pushed uh, as the, uh, the fifth row. And there's also one interesting thing here that um, you can add stretch to uh, this special method here that basically it's like a spring between here. So it, it will not kind of, it will kind of add an invisible control that pushes the buttons on top here. So if I dr drag down, you see here that they, those are still here on the top and those are on the bottom here because there's a invisible spring here added by the stretch command here. And I added a stretch here to the between buttons five and six as well. So if I resize in this direction here, you can see there, this will be left behind. And there is a spring here that pushes the button to the right here. So using this, you can combine them to quite powerful um, user interface layouts that automatically resizes to the window size. Uh, there is also another one uh, called a grid layout. Uh, and the grid layout is basically uh, rows and columns. So what you can do then, you can you can give a control a certain uh, row and, and coordinate, uh, and and uh, it's not the coordinate with pixels. It's more of a if you have a user interface that is. Uh, I bet I think I showed a slide instead here. Um, So this is a grid layout. Uh, I have a uh, buttons in a in a three rows and three columns, and and you can you add the buttons here, and you specify a coordinate here. So zero zero is uh, uh, row row zero column zero, and then so on. And then you you put the buttons here in this layout. Um, you can also set if the bat buttons should expand or like this, and you can also add stretching here just like we did before, so that you can uh, uh, make the different control scale in different ways. So let's see here if we can run this. So I have my nine buttons here. And if I drag down, you see here that these are scaled. And this is also scaled like this. So by combining different settings here, you can you can get your desired layout here. Okay, we will take uh, 
uh, coffee break now. Uh, we'll get back at quarter past uh, four. That's okay. Okay, so let's continue. So uh, next things I want to discuss is uh, some of the most common tasks that you have an application that you can um, make easier with you, uh, certain tools in Qt. So in many cases, uh, for example, selecting a, a file on the, in the file system or select uh, saving a file, uh, these tests, there are system provided dialogues for this. And those are encapsulated in, in uh, Qt as well. And there's, those are typically divided in three categories. You have message dialogues, basically saying something happened, pops up to a small box where you can press OK. File dialogues for selecting files. Uh, color dialogues for selecting colors. Uh, and what you can do then also is, uh, so the first one here, I don't go, I don't show all the running examples here. I will just show them here. So in this case here, there is something called a queue message box, uh, and that has uh, three or four methods here which you can call. The first one, information, for displaying shorter informational messages that is not critical. Um, the first parameter is the the window uh, object, so it's a message box always has to be attached to a window. Uh, made and is the caption of the window, and then ouch is the actual message. Uh, there is also one called critical, uh, which is if something goes seriously wrong in your application, uh, you can use this one. Same parameters, uh, but a different icon. Also, be, be a bit careful when if something goes wrong in in your um, that is not kind of doesn't crash your application. Use these, this kind of message very sparingly because it's kind of um, very in your face to the user. <laughs> so uh, use this sparingly. Uh, there's also a warning that is something between uh, information and critical. Um, on the left, you see the Mac version, and on the right is the Windows version of this. Uh, I have a clicker, but it doesn't work anymore. Let's see. This. Uh, there's also a message box for asking uh, simple questions like yes or no or cancel. Uh, it's called a question. And then you can specify here that you want to have uh, uh, either, let's see here. Uh, either a yes, no, and also you specify which is the default answer here, which is no. And then you can call it here. You can check the result here. And you can see here that if it's yes, then it's user selected yes. Uh, file dialogues is also something very useful. So for example, if you want to open an input file for your file element code, you can use the get open file name in the Q file dialog clause. You specify the caption and also uh, you can have a default file name. You can also have a filter that is, uh, only shows uh, files with an extension of INP, for example. And if it returns an empty string, the user cancel the dialog. Otherwise, you get the complete uh, file string here for the file. Uh, you have the corresponding here, the save file name. So if you want to ask the user for uh, a specific file name for a new file that you want to save or the data you want to save to uh, hasn't been saved before, you can get the save file name. So the user can enter the file name, and then you get back the entire uh, suggested file name with, with the directories, which you can use them to create to so save the file to. Uh, controls is another important part of the, we have already started with, we showed you the Q, the Q push button here. Um, there are different ones you can uh, have. So there are Q checkbox for uh, a control that is either on or off. There's radio button, which is a, is a special version of a checkbox, uh, which is um, only one of these control can be checked in a group at the same time. So uh, radio button has to be grouped 
in certain um, in groups in, in the uh, user interface to be able to be used correctly. Otherwise, if you have radio buttons, only one of them can be checked at the same time. Uh, so this is an example here of a checkbox. So this is the Mac version here. It shows you a small icon here with a checkbox, and this means that it's checked. And you, you can set the check status here using the set check method. You can also connect, there is a signal called state changed. So when, when the user checks this box, uh, this, this signal is, is um, called. So in this case, it, it will, it will um, call this method every time the, the user checks this box or unchecks it. Uh, this is a radio button. You can see here that the, one of them is, is marked uh, as uh, active and the other one is not active. And one of them um, is always checked and the other ones are unchecked. So this is handled automatically. But if you want to have multiple radio box groups, then you have to put them in, in special groups in the user interface as well. For example, it, it's, it would work in uh, sizers as well. Combo box is a special ver version of a, uh, it provides the user with options here where you, which, which shows you the currently selected option. And if you click a box, it will drop down a list of items you can choose. So the, the benefits of this box is that it, it doesn't take up so much room in the user interface. And the signal that can be connected is the current item changed. So when a user selects something in combo box, the current item change is called. And there is a method called current index that returns the currently selected item index in, in this um, combo box. So here is an example here. This is the combo box here. Uh, usually there is a small symbol here that you can click and it will drop down a list of items here. So I add items here using add item and just add several, four text items here. I set the current item index here. Uh, this is the, the default selected item in the combo box. And here I connect uh, the signal current index changed to my method here to kind of display what happens here. Let's see if I can show this one. So add items here. Uh, and then I have set current, this is the default selection here. So this is zero, one, two, and three. So the alternative four should be shown. So let's see if I run this. So now I have my combo box here with four items in it. And if you saw, saw that it, the number four was selected because I set the current index method. So if I select one here, you can see you chose zero and you can also get the text selected text as well. So if you look here, the combo box, the current text is the current text selected and the current index is the, the index selected. Another control that is, uh, can be interesting in some application is the slider. So if you want to big, uh, build a musical application, you probably want some volume sliders for your mixer, then you can use the Q slider control. So it enables you to kind of enter numerical values quickly. And you can set options for range and fixed positions on the scale. So this is an example here. So this is a vertical slider. Uh, you set that using this property here when you can create them. And this is a horizontal slider. And you set this QT horizontal here. There's a signal called value changed that you can connect to your method here, which is called every time the, the slider is updated. A list box is very similar to a combo box, but it shows all the alternatives in, in, in a list. Uh, and it can be used when you select what to have the user ability to select from an, uh, a large number of items. And also if you add very a lot of items in, in the control, it will add scroll bars if needed. It also supports 
uh, you can enable it. You can multi you do a multiple selection as well. So this is uh, how it looks. So you have a this is the text box or list box control, and here you can add items to it. Uh, and here I added 100 items to this this uh, list here. Um, and the same thing, you can set current row, uh, and you can also current row change the same for the combo box, and you connect this here as well. So it basically it works almost identically to a combo box, but it it shows you all the alternatives in a, in, a, in a different. So depending on the application, you can choose either one of these. If you have not so much room in your user interface, the combo box could be better. Line edit is probably something that you will use a lot in your application. So it shows a text box where you can the user can enter text values. You can set the text of the text box using the sec text method. You can retrieve it using the text method. So here I have a text control that looks like this on a Mac. Uh, it's called QLine Edit, and you can set the text here using the text. So this is what will show up when it's the, the program is started. And when you click the button here, it will take the text here and display that as well. I have my line edit here. I run my code. So now I can end. So you see it showed text here. This was a default text. You type anything here. And I press the button here. It displays a text box like this. Very useful. It's usually used when you have to have a numeric entry and stuff like that. So it will be used in your application here as well. Uh, so I have shown you how, how you can connect the user interface um, events to the your code. But if the user interface is getting large, you will have a lot of control, perhaps several hundreds uh, that you need to, to query and get methods from or get, or get values from. Uh, and uh, it is important that you kind of structure your code in a way that you can handle this in an easy way or in a structured way. Uh, so usually I uh, define my computational model in a certain cl class that is my model, uh, and I have my user interface code, user interface code completely separate from um, from my uh, computational model. And that means also that I can take my computational model and put that in a different um, user interface library or in a web interface without kind of uh, there's dependency on, on the user interface code. So usually what I do is I have a I define a method in my my main window class is called update controls. And that method takes the values from the model and populates the controls with values. And then when the user presses OK, for example, in the dialog box, uh, you have a method called update model that goes through the user interface controls, retrieves the text, converts them to values, and assigns them to your to the model, the computational model. And that kind of puts everything in two places, and you don't have to kind of look around in your entire code to find where where things is going in and out to the model. Uh, like that. So this is an example here. Uh, this is my very simplified computation model uh, here. I have my text values here. I have a value one, an option, an alternative, value two. I have a routine to print it out. Uh, I have a simple user interface that just shows these things here. And then I have um, basically two me methods here. So I have a update controls that takes the data that is in the model here and transfer them to my user interface. So this you probably usually do when you load a new model, uh, when the pr program starts up, uh, you populate with default values, and then you do set text, set checked, uh, set value. 
if you have different uh, options here, for example, if model alternative one, then check uh, set check true to my checkbox, for example. And then when I uh, when the user changes anything, you want to get the values back from the controls. So basically, you want to go in this direction here. So from controls to model. Then you have to think everything in Qt, all the controls use text as the default. So there are no basically there's one control that does floating point, but most of the controls return a text value. So when you go from the controls to the model, you need to convert from string to uh, a value and vice versa. So if you go from the model to controls, you need to convert to a string. Um, so that this is something you have to think about. And that all, all, this, all this conversion is done, I, I put in two, two methods, one update controls and one update model. So just illustrate with a complete example, I, I want to implement a simple, uh, a simple user interface for a simply supported beam. So this is probably the, the most simple uh, computational uh, mechanics application you can implement. So very simple, I have a, a force P here that is acting on a beam, it's simply supported. Um, here are all the expressions that I will be using in my model. So all of this here, I will put into a model, a model clause. So the, the goal is that the model will be completely separate from the user interface, but it's still very simple and easy to use from the, from the user interface. So the conception model for this is that I want to create a model called beam simply support. And it should be, you should be set, you should be set the values here, beam.a equals to one, beam.b equals to two, the, the force, the elastic modulus, and the, the moments of inertia. I set these properties, and then I can, uh, um, you can query the beam. It has functions here for uh, calculating the section forces, the shear forces, the moment, uh, and you can loop over this. So it's, it's completely contained here. And now I want to create a user interface for this. Just to illustrate here how it's implemented. So um, I'm going to use uh, the, the conversion to and from strings will actually be done inside uh, this model class. So what I'm using here is I'm using uh, hidden variables here for my for, for the actual storage of the attributes, and I will use in properties to do the conversion. So what I do here is I, I have created a method in my my model called to float. So the new value here, this is uh, what the, what is going to come from the user interface going into uh, the model. And I also specify an old value here. So if something goes wrong, it will only com convert back to the old value. So I'm using here uh, an exception here. So I will do try v, which is the value I want to kind of convert to float. I do the float conversion here. If the new value is a string that is not kind of convertible to a floating point, you will get an exception. And what happens then, it will return the old value. So that it's, it's impossible for the user to kind of mess up here. If you enter something wrong, the only thing will happen is that old value will be uh, assigned again. And I will re return the correct value here if, if, we, if we go that far. And then I will use um, a get set method here to for my properties. So in this way, I, I will get A, I will return A. If I assign A, I will call my to float method here. Uh, so it, it's impossible to assign an invalid floating point to A. It will always be converted to something. If, if it's wrong, it will use the previous correct version of A here as the, the old value. So all the conversion is done inside this model here. So I don't, want to, don't have to do that in, in my um, user interface. And I, I define my properties here. Uh, a and B are modifiable. Length is a read-only property, so it's calculated from adding A and B. So that's why I only have a get L here. And then I have my methods here for uh, actually computing the different deflections and moments and, and stuff like that. Then I want to create a user interface like this. So uh, the idea here is that uh, the user interface should be modifiable. So if I change here, this table will update instantaneously. 
So the B model here, uh, I import that. So this is a separate module here, like you had done in your code. Um, I in my main window, I create a beam object here that that my window kind of holds. Initialize the GUI. I update the controls, uh, and I, I populate my user interface here with values. Oh, sorry, with, with controls. And here I have uh, also. So when the user has edited a control, uh, there's a signal called editing finished. It will call self editing or finished. And you can see here that I can co connect multiple signals to a single method. So every time anything is edited in any of the controls, it will only call the same, same method here. So now I have update controls with, it was uh, assigned the text of A, uh, by just calling str, which converts to a string, the floating point value of beam A. And then the, there's also an update text edit here, um, which is uh, creates the table here. Uh, and then I have an update model here that takes the control values and assigns them to the, to the model like this. And um, now we need to handle the, when the user edits the text box, something needs to happen. So the first thing I do is update model. Uh, so it takes the values from the text box and assigns them to the model. And then I update the text edit here to calculate the values in the table automatically. And then I need to update the controls here again. So that is because if the user enters wrong values, they need to kind of leash. Uh, the old value must be displayed again. So let's see here. I can run this example. So this is the beam model, complete code for that. You, you will get this as well, so you can you can look at it in your own time, uh, like this. And then my beam user interface is here. So when I run this here now, you can see here it called update controls. And uh, what that took then, it took the values from the beam model and it populate, populated the text controls here. Um, so what I, if I do 1.5 here and I do a tab here, you can see here that it automatically updates here. Is that three here? Sorry. We can't see the... Ah, sorry. Oops. Thank you. Uh, it's my sharing here. Let's try again. Okay. You should see it now, I hope, yes. Um, so what it did first, it updated the controls and then, um, so when I do a change here, so I do point zero here and I click again here, you can see that the this table is updated automatically. If I change the force here to 2000, it's also updated automatically. So what happens if I put, uh, so the length A is, a, you can see here it doesn't accept that. So it automatically assigns the old value here again. So if I just put something in here, it returns back again. So in this way, I have created a separation between um, the model and the user interface. Uh, so now, I mean, there is no, if you look at the B model here, this B model is completely independent from any user interface. So you can take this and implement the web-based user interface with this. Um, there's no QT dependencies here. It's completely standalone. And that is the idea that you, uh, I will think about encapsulating different functionality in, in objects and modules so that you can reuse the code again. That's really important. Um, so now I'm going to let's see.
So as you have seen, the user interface code can be very, very complicated. And I saved this best part for the last part here because this is uh, makes everything much, much easier. And the tool that you can use to, to uh, simplify the user interface code is called Qt Designer. And Qt Designer is an application that you can use to uh, draw the user interface and generate a description of the user interface so that you don't have to write all these code for the different controls. Um, so you read in the user interface from a special file called a UI file, and that will create all the controls for you automatically. Um, and, and also it supports all the layout tools that, that I showed you, the vertical sizes and the horizontal sizes all built in, and you can do those graphically. And it's much, much easier to, to try out different user interface in, the, in this sense. Um, so that's very uh, nice. So differences here in your code is that you need to specify a way of reading these UI, UI files, and that is done by importing a special library called UIC. Uh, and that stands for User Interface Compiler. So it reads this text file that describes the user interface and translates that into actual user interface objects. So you can access all the all the, 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 the named values in this file, you can access like they were you had created them yourself in your code. So in this case here, I will load a user interface file called form for UI, attach it to my own window. And in this UI file, there is a control called push button, which you can access here directly. So when, when you have done this, self.push button exists in your code. And this could be 200, 300 controls, and it's only a single line to load it, and your code will be kind of much, much nicer uh, it doesn't show all these kind of messy user interface control code. You still need to um, connect your user interface controls together. That, that is something you need to do manually, but you don't have to specify all the coordinates or all that uh, complicated stuff in your code. So what I'm going to do now, uh, so let's see if I can draw here. This pen and I want to use a black pen. I want to create. I will create a user interface in Qt now, and uh, the basic idea is that uh, not like that. So it will have a, a window like this, uh, on the top left here. I will have. Uh, a kind of toolbar here with buttons here that will be displayed on the right side. I have the same number of buttons on the right side here. And then on the on the bottom here, I will also have some buttons here and uh, some buttons here on the, like this. And here I will have a text editor display like this. So, and, and one, one thing you can, what I usually do when I do user interface is I will look at the user interface and see, is there any patterns here? I can see that I have a kind of a column here. I have a column here and a, some kind of column here. There is also, these are grouped here in a single row. And there is a row here in the bottom here. So I, we could see that you can have a, uh, these here are organized. Um, these controls here are organized in a, a vertical layout. Same thing with these controls here. They, these are also organized in a vertical layout. Um, these are, this one here, these columns here are in a, a column wise orientation. And here you have a global in, in, in this direction here. So let's see if we can start Qt Creator. Um, 
So this is how Qt Qt Creator looks like. Uh, so what I want to do is I will create a very simple window here, uh, and I will base it on a widget class. You can also do a main window if you want to have menus here, but for this example, I will just use the widget here. So create, and now you get a window here that you can, uh, it's kind of, kind of your blank paper that you can use. On the left side here, you have all the controls that you can use. You also see that you have vertical layout, you have horizontal layout, you have grid layout, and so on. Uh, so what I do when I when I start using, I just kind of add the controls I want. So I just drag in the push buttons here like this, um, and then I want some on the right side. Just do the same thing here. Don't have to be so kind of. Um, um, you can drag them kind of just haphazardly. They don't have to kind of be aligned or something like that. You just just add them to the control to the window. Then I want a text editor. So let's see what I. Um, like this, and then I want to have buttons on the bottom here as well, something like that. So when I have this, all the controls I need, uh, I usually start arranging them in obvious ways. So these four buttons are, I want it to be together. So just. Uh, select them and press shift select or control select to add these four together and then you uh, say i want to organize them vertically i cl click this button here on the top and you see here the buttons are organized together vertically and i do the same thing with these right buttons here like this and these are or should be or or organized horizontally so i just click here like that and i press this one layout horizontally like that. So now I have uh, four major uh, control kind of groups that I want to kind of organize in, in a global way. So I, these three here can be organized horizontally. So I select this one here, this one, and this. They're a bit tricky to pick here. So let's see here, again, like that. And then I organize horizontally like this. So now I have two controls here, and they should be organized uh, vertically. So this one should be uh, below this one here. So I can do the same thing. I mark this one, or, or, or I can actually set the entire window to be organized vertically like this. And now you can see here that it's arranged the buttons um, and filled up the entire window like this. But this doesn't look what I wanted. I wanted the push button to be on top. And the nice thing here is that we briefly mentioned it before using this add stretch method. And if you look at on the left side here, there, are, there is something called a vertical spacer and a horizontal spacer. They, 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 those are like springs that you can add to your to layout. So if I drag this one in and I drag it here, it will add a spring here that will push all the buttons to the top. And I do the same thing on the right here. I, I see it turns blue and then I release it and then it's it adds those push this pushes this button to the top and i also want to have a, have a these two buttons here should be to the right and this should be to the left so i can add a spring between those here so i take a horizontal spacer and i put them in between like this uh, now i have to cover some of the so on, on the right side here you have a, something called an object inspector so this is the object um, hierarchy that you have created. Uh, kind of nice to see how it's organized. And you can see also that everything is named. Push button, push button two. And you saw in my code here, I had, um, let's see if I can find that. Um, I had a push button here, the press me button here. And I, so I want to create, so I take this button here and I, when I click on this, the property values here comes up. So this is a property inspector. It shows all the properties that you have for the control. So you can see here, it starts from the, the basic object here. Here you can give a name. So you, I give it press like this. And this is the name of the variable in your code later on. So this will be a variable that you can reference like self.pressme button. It will be available in your code. 
Then you have all the properties of the Q widget here. So you can see here that you have enabled, which we use set enabled, set this uh, true or false. And further down here, you have the actual Q button special properties for this here. So you can see here that you have different properties for the, the button here you can set. You can also set the text of the button here. So it says push button here, but I will say press me instead. So now it's, uh, you can see here that the button changed here. So now I need to save this user interface here uh, to a file. So I press save here. And then now I have to put it in the right folder here. Um, UI, I call it form 7 UI like that. And you see here that I call it form 7 UI here. So let's see if it works. So we run it. And look, now I have my user interface I designed in um, Qt Designer is now a standalone program. And hopefully when I press my button here, you see also that this is the signal connection worked here. So I had a, um, put set, clicked here, connect. And the press me button, I cr didn't create in my code. It was created by USC, UIC load UI that created all the objects for us. So every object in Qt Designer is an object that you can access. And that's why it's very good when you, you're working with Qt Designer that you uh, give things logical names. So push button underscore two is probably not a good name to remember. So you should probably rename your, all your controls with logical names, but because that is the names you will need to know to be able to access the, the text that has been assigned to the control, for example. So it's important that you name your things correctly. Uh, I think there is, there, every, there is a video already on, on how to you can use uh, Qt as well um, in the Canvas material. Um, and I will provide a video as soon as I have converted to the Zoom uh, video session here. So probably tomorrow will the lecture will be available. The slides are already available, um, and there's also yeah there are several there are also uh, all the code for that I've shown in this um, lecture is available a source code and you can download them and use them yourself. So uh, please look at look into all these. Uh, examples here uh, before you can perhaps start coding a lot in, in, in your own code, just to kind of get the familiarity how, how, the, how Qt works. So that was actually what I had to cover today. So I will just stop the recording.